Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Ulysses Grant, and the focus is commanding general and victory. The year is 1864. Lincoln has decided to go all in with Grant after the victory in Chattanooga. He brings him to Washington, D.C., where he gives him his commission as a lieutenant general, only the third man ever to hold that rank, in charge of the entire Union Army. Grant goes to the White House, meets Lincoln actually for the first time, gets his commission, and the man of very few words does say that acknowledging the full weight of the responsibilities now devolving on me, and I know that if they are met, it will be due to those armies, and above all, to the favor of that providence, which leads both nations and men. What to expect with Grant now in charge? Well, some folks who knew him well were on the other side, Confederate generals like James Longstreet, who said, I was with him for three years at West Point. I was present at his wedding. I served in the same army with him in Mexico. I have observed his methods of warfare in the West, and I believe I know him through and through. And I tell you, we cannot afford to underrate him and the army he now commands. We must make up our minds to get into the line of battle and stay there, for that man will fight us every day and every hour till the end of this war. And that was exactly right. So the changes now the arrangements. Henry Halleck, who had been the commander in chief, would stay in Washington, D.C. as the Army Chief of Staff, reporting to Grant, but his job was to kind of keep the politicians in line and let Grant do what he wanted because Grant was going in the field. He was the first commanding general not to sit in Washington. That was not his style. He wanted to be where the action was. He decided to keep George Meade in charge of the Army of the Potomac, but Grant's headquarters would be near Meade every step of the way. Grant had a five-pronged plan. Meade would focus on General Robert E. Lee and the Confederates in Virginia. William Sherman had taken over his command in the West. His job, go into Georgia and attack directly into the Deep South. Franz Siegel, his focus, the Shenandoah Valley. Benjamin Butler, he would focus on trying to get to Richmond via the James River, which they tried before, very difficult. That was his task. And the last uh, was Nathaniel Banks in Mobile, Alabama, fighting for the Northern uh, Army in the Deep South. The orders were to attack, attack, attack. And by the way, if, they, if the enemy tries to escape, whatever you do, don't let them to connect with these other parts of the Confederate Army. Grant left most of his former command in the West with Sherman, but he brought a few people with him, including his ever-reliable top aide. Um, that was John Rollins, now a one-star general, and he also brought Phil Sheridan, one of the youngest generals in the Army, really impressed Grant at the Battle of Chattanooga. He wanted Sheridan to be in charge of the cavalry as part of the Overland Campaign, which was finally gonna launch in May of 1864. Grant, 120,000 men, Lee had only 60,000, but in some ways Lee had the advantage in that he knew the land, he could pick the land in which to fight, he had the people in the towns were all supporting him, and his folks were fighting for their very existence, and they were going to fight hard, this was going to be bloody, and it was all summer. In fact, half of those original units on both sides would end up as casualties. Grant would lose 60,000 to casualties, Lee 35,000 in only about six weeks. This is where the cries of the butcher label came in from those who were the critics of Ulysses Grant, simply throwing bodies away to try to defeat the South. Well, Grant believed the way to win this war as quickly as possible was to do that, to throw men into the breach. And if this was a war of attrition, more resources on the northern side, he was going to win that fight. It may be bloody, but it actually might shorten the war. And there was one man who was all for this kind of aggressive attack, and that was President Lincoln. The main fights in the Overland Campaign were places called the Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, and Cold Harbor. And Grant was getting a little testy at the very beginning of this at the Wilderness when he kept getting told about the greatness of his of his rival Robert E. Lee, and he was tired of it. Grant said, oh, I am heartily tired of hearing about what Lee is going to do. Some of you always seem to think he is suddenly going to turn a double somersault and land in our rear and on both of our flanks at the same time. Go back to your command and try to think what we are going to do ourselves instead of what Lee is going to do. Kind of a rare bit of emotion there from a frustrated General Grant. Well, they moved on to Spotsylvania Courthouse, a bloody battle. This was William Swinton of the New York Times, who wrote that nothing during the war had equaled the savage desperation of this struggle, and the scene of the conflict from which I have just come presents a spectacle of horror that curdles the blood of the boldest. 
The one exclamation of every man who looks on the spectacle is, God forbid that I should ever gaze upon such a sight again. But Grant was undeterred. He wrote to his commander, uh, the, rather the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, that I propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. He was not giving up. He was going to continue to provoke the attack. Well, Cold Harbor was next. Now, this is just eight miles east, east of Richmond. He's getting close, but this was a bloodbath. Grant lost 7,000 men, most in the first half hour, and even he had to call off this fight. Lee's men were simply too entrenched. There was no way through them at Cold Harbor. So he decided to do something else. He decided to go in a different direction. He was going to go around. And for this, he decided to cross the James River and go south of Richmond and fight through Petersburg, the town of Petersburg that was again right adjacent to Richmond. But he had to do this. If he was going to do it, he had to do it quickly. He wanted to do it before Lee could move his men to reinforce that southern tip of the city. So he kept a, a lot of activity going on around Cold Harbor, but it was mostly as a feint. He had his engineers build the longest pontoon bridge in history. 2,100 feet, 100 pontoon ships, boats were put into place, where finally on June the 17th, 100,000 men and all of their supplies started going across the James River. Out in the lead, Generals Benjamin Butler and Baldy Smith. Their job was to assault those Petersburg works before we could get there with reinforcements. And they tried and they failed. The Confederate defenses were simply too strong. They could not get through. And by the time Grant had enough men to push through, we had adjusted. And now we were, they were in a, once again somewhat of a stalemate, which meant at this time for Grant was time for a siege. Shut it down, try to st uh, uh, get, starve them out, and eventually attack when the time was right. Now, there was still one railroad line that was going into Richmond. So there were some supplies coming out. Most of the rest were all taken out by the Union Army. There was one that was going in that was still defended by the Confederates. But this was going to be a slow churn where eventually starvation and lack of provisions would kick in. But that was going to take a while. Grant was going frustrated. Through the ranks, there was an idea from a lieutenant colonel by the name of Henry Pleasance. He was a mining engineer for Pennsylvania, and he had this idea of actually constructing a mine going underneath the Confederate works, setting off a big explosion, opening up a, a, a defensive break, and be able to go in and break through that Confederate line. Well, there was a lot of debate about this, good idea or not. They never tried something exactly like this before, but Grant eventually said yes, and he put General Ambrose Burnside in charge. And sure enough, those coal miners from Pennsylvania and the other soldiers that were engaged built that mine shaft. They went 20 feet below the surface and 511 feet to get under the Confederate works. Four tons of, of gunpowder were put, in, were put in place. The idea was have the big explosion and then uh, Union soldiers would go into the breach and open up a hole. And they had a unit of black soldiers who were actually trained to take that mission while the mine was being built. At the last minute, there was concern about using these black soldiers in this fight, and they took them out of the line and put another general, James Ledley, in charge. He was one of the least experienced generals that they had, but he was going to take white soldiers, go through trench lines, and eventually storm through once the explosion occurs. So, July 30th at 4.46 a.m., massive explosion took place. The South Carolinians lost 300 men immediately. They were blown sky high. Their works were blown up. The big crater was uh, formed, and the Union soldiers were going through the trenches to try to get to break through. This is where the chaos and confusion set in, and the Confederates rallied much faster than the Union uh, Army had, had, had expected, and they started beating back the Union soldiers. So what did the Union do? They sent in those black troops, and those black troops who actually went into the crater where they got stuck. And this became a shooting gallery for the Confederates, who were now right around the ridge of the crater, fully engaged in their line, and they were taking out the black soldiers literally left and right. It became a murderous shooting gallery. There was no quarter, no prisoners were going to be taken. They were taking out their revenge. 504 Union soldiers were killed in this disaster. Grant was crestfallen. He said, it was the saddest affair I have witnessed in this war, and still no breakthrough. So the siege continued. 
Well, Abraham Lincoln, of course, was up for re-election. He was nervous. He was waiting for some kind of big military victory, and it wasn't going to come from Grant. It came from Sherman, who reported in early September that Atlanta is ours and fairly won. This was the key motivation for the electorate to continue with Abraham Lincoln. He won his re-election, obviously a big victory, and Lincoln then had a favor to ask. Favor to ask of Ulysses Grant. His son Robert had wanted to be in the fight for a long time, but the First Lady Mary Lincoln was absolutely against it. She had already lost one son recently. She wasn't going to lose another one. But Lincoln had the idea, look, maybe Grant could put Robert Lincoln in uniform and have him on his staff, kind of the safety of City Point, which was the place on the James River that they had put as Grant's headquarters. And Lincoln asked him for the favor. Grant said, fine. Happy to bring him in. Well, Lincoln and Grant actually started spending a fair amount of time together at City Point as they started talking about the end of the war, what Reconstruction might start looking like. Well, there was a peace commission that actually came to visit with Lincoln as they were also trying to figure out some way to maybe end this war. So the Confederates showed up at City Point and Lincoln basically only had a couple of things that Grant relayed that Lincoln insisted upon. According to Grant, for Lincoln, it was first that the Union as a whole must be forever preserved and second, that slavery must be abolished. If they were willing to concede these two points, then he was ready to enter into negotiations and was almost willing to hand them a blank sheet of paper with his signature attached for them to fill in the terms upon which they were willing to live with us in the Union and be one people. He saw Lincoln as being very generous in terms of trying to get the Confederates back as holy parts of the Union as quickly as possible. In fact, those conversations kind of continued. Grant and Sherman and Admiral Porter met with Lincoln on the River Queen on March 28, 1865. This is after Lincoln's second inauguration where he went public with his statement, malice toward none, charity for all. Everyone was anticipating sort of an uplifting moment of a reunification after the war was over which of course was still up to Grant. The siege eventually ended after 293 days as Lincoln's men were finally desperate. They were running out of supplies. They had to make a break for it. The rainy season was over. It was time to go. And sure enough, they made that break out, but Grant was right on his tail. Lee was a little bit ahead, but we had no provisions. This was not going to work out. And after a couple of weeks, the commanders are changing letters, exchanging letters, and they talk about meeting to have terms. The pair met on April the 8th at Wilmer McLean's house at Appomattox Courthouse. We came full dress, sash and sword, whereas Grant was in his typical plain outfit. In fact, it was a bit muddy. The, the two talked briefly at the beginning of, of this uh, occasion. They reminisced a little bit about their time together in Mexico where they had met briefly, but mostly this was a solemn affair and they got straight down to business. Grant wrote out the terms and basically said all of Lee's men, the entire army would be paroled. His men would be expected to go home, sit out the rest of the war unless they were properly exchanged going forward. Lee agreed to these terms. He asked for one favor. Could the men keep their horses? He knew that these were farmers. They needed to go back and have a livelihood if the South was going to resurrect in some way. And so Grant thought about it, said that was reasonable. Lee was quite thankful. Grant gave 25,000 rations to the Confederates who laid down their arms and they were done. The Army of Virginia was no more. Celebrations abounded across the North. Grant was, of course, the hero. He was off to Washington. He met with the cabinet as at a cabinet meeting. And that evening, Grant was invited by Lincoln to go to a play. He and Mary were going to Ford's Theater to see a play called Our American Cousin. They wanted Grant and his wife Julia to join them, and the Grant said no. Julie and, and Mary Lincoln had gotten into a little bit of a tiff recently at City Point, and frankly, Julie didn't really want to socialize with Mary Lincoln at the time. They wanted to go see their children who were in New Jersey, so they got on a train and left. Of course, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated that night at Ford's Theater, and Grant was he wished he had been there. He was devastated by the fact that he wasn't there to try to protect his commander-in-chief. And of course, he was extremely mournful over the loss to himself and the country. He said, it would be impossible for me to describe the feeling that overcame me at the news of these assassinations. I knew his goodness of heart, his generosity, his yielding disposition, his desire to have everybody happy, and above all, his desire to see all the people of the United States enter again upon the full privileges of citizenship with equality among all. That's what Grant had been hoping for. Grant and Lincoln had finally put a bow on this war. They had won it. Would they be able to win the peace, though, without Abraham Lincoln? 
That is the story for another day, and that is Ulysses Grant, commanding general and victory. From the life of Ulysses Grant, for more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.